Hello and welcome to Living Black. I'm Carla Grant. Tonight in our final episode for the series, we speak with longtime fighter for Indigenous rights, Dr Loja O'Donoghue. In sport, we catch up with champion athlete Nova Paris, and in the arts, the musical talents of the Stiff Gins. That's later. Our feature story tonight concerns the National Repository for Low-Level Radioactive Waste, one of Australia's most controversial developments. Along with science and political debates, there are concerns at the lack of consultation with Aboriginal groups. Producer Tanya Denning investigates this issue at the site of the proposed waste dump in South Australia. Uh, on the soapbox. Hello, Peter. Good morning. Good morning. Fellas, I've really appreciated your coverage of all this uranium stuff all week. For 10 years, the federal government has been in search of the perfect place for the nation's low-level radioactive waste. It's here, in South Australia's north, that a piece of land the size of a football field on a sheep station 20 kilometres east of Woomera was identified. We are now supposed to breathe a great sigh of relief and gratitude that we are going to get all of Australia's low-level radiation deposits. It's just fantastic. I mean, to me, radiation is radiation is radiation. We're going to become the asshole of Australia. We're going to become the great shitting hole of for radiation for this country, if you'll excuse the French. The area, named by Aboriginal people as Arcuna, which means underground water, is supposedly the safest and most cost-effective place for the waste, mostly because of its stable and dry environment. However, local Aboriginal groups question the safety and also the motives behind the decision, especially after what they say have been only token consultations with all stakeholders. From being a virgin site, it has, you know, slowly but surely been disturbed. The local Aboriginal groups were consulted, though, with how to approach this site. Yes, it's like they say, well, OK, all this area is significant to you, but we're asking, we want to put a site here. And it's like saying, well, which hand do you want to cut off? Your right hand or your left hand? Which hand are you right with? You keep your right hand so you cut your left hand, left hand off. That's what we've done. No choice. No choice. You know? Who in their right mind wants to get a waste dump in their backyard? Especially when the government won't give you, give you commitment that it's not going to lead to bigger things. When the federal government announced its decision to dump the waste on the site they call 40A, they assured every aspect in locating it was considered. And despite the government's own Indigenous Advisory Committee warning against the dump site for cultural, heritage and environmental reasons, the Federal Minister for Environment and Heritage, Dr David Kemp, ticked off on the site. The Federal Science Minister, Peter McGorran, now awaits Senator Nick Mitchin to consider the entire process and take the next steps to acquire the land. You know, I, I do have to say that it's in the national interest we build this. It will be perfectly safe. There'll be no more than normal background radiation from this, uh, from this site and it will occupy a very small area and I, I really believe it will not upset or affect uh, Aboriginal interests and Aboriginal heritage in this area. Some of the things you find around here are you know, things like this. This is what we call a piri point. Used for uh, cutting flesh and all that sort of thing. This one is a scraper uh, for, for taking fat off of uh, hides and that sort of thing. You can see here, percussion point, where it bulbed. Um, a bit of working around the edge to make it uh, look serrated. So it's a, it's a good, good hand size, good for scraping off of, um, as I said, fat and all that sort of stuff. So what sort of impact will the waste dump have on sites like this that are obviously scattered throughout this region? One of the things um, that we find distressing is that uh, although this area is heavily impacted upon by the pasture industry and um, past activities, out there it's pristine country. No one's been out there, and uh, apart from our, our lot of course. <laughs> um, you know, they have to build a road that's going to traverse uh, creek lines and that sort of stuff. And even during the investigation process, we pointed out areas to avoid, and they actually um, driven over sites and things like that. So 
in order for them to put a road out there, they're going to have to do desecration sites. Within 12 months, all of Australia's low-level radioactive waste will make its way to the dump, the majority coming from the Lucas Heights nuclear reactor in Sydney. Under several metres of dirt will be about 3,700 cubic metres of radioactive material, like contaminated clothing from hospitals and smoke detectors. Scientists say the waste is stored in a way that it could leach into the environment, but they predict it will disappear by the time this happens. You sit there and you look around and you see, you know, when I sit there, um, when I sit there, uh, I don't just see uh, an area flat void of trees or gibber country, I see how the land was made. You know? I see the, uh, our spiritual beings, our cultural beings, making, the, making the, the landscape, the features, all that sort of stuff. You know? It's just not void of anything. It's, it's there. It's, uh, what's there? It's... The Kupa Piri Kunga Juda is a group of senior Aboriginal women from the northern lands of South Australia. They've been fighting tirelessly against the nation's nuclear industry for years. And long before any Greenies heard about the national dump, these women began campaigning. The Kungas have taken their message of Irati Wanti, the poison, leave it, throughout Australia and the world, winning the prestigious International Goldman Environmental Prize for their efforts. My mother, and I think this is the most amazing part, she laid down in front of the bulldozers. Beyond the money, beyond the accolades, this is a recognition of spirit. You have given great spirit to the land. You are giving great spirit to the community. You give great spirit to us all. This prize is really a giving from you to us. These women are weary and tired. And while they feel proud of the groundswell of support they've created against the dump, their angry and frustrated government has ignored their warnings. Well, that's going to rust in there one day and it's going to leak out of there and it's going to leak into the underground river there and people still living on it because we, they do drill bore there to get a water because it doesn't stop on the land on top. And we'll be killing everybody, everything. Go like that. Hello? See, there it is. The food and lands the women and their families live off need what little water lies under the ground to survive the same water that flows under the proposed site of the nuclear dump. The Kunga Juda say this nuclear dump will poison their land. What has been their life source for thousands of generations will be lost to them and their children forever. Despite assurances this won't be the case, the Kungas say you just have to look at history to know government is not to be trusted.
kolo pegaring. Set night ngaringo konjo pungang ko ngana na por kalu ya nyenengi mun ngana na mung nyara polaman. Ko Pada kuda dikin, an ngai lebi kuda dari pingem, an paling bikin, dari an mam. Kojo bajo ra cil bijo ra, cindo kojo ba, panyawiar ngai ngai oko kanggoro, pega pulka, an yono, kojo mungka ka, kang kaman dang ko yal ji kolini. Ara yal ji ro angan na ngong gago. Wai. Palu chan na pin na wiya. Kaman tang kunya. Mono hobon na hobon ta bini. It's now 50 years since the South Australian desert was first used to test British nuclear bombs. All the Kungas have stories of survival. However, many of their people, including children, still suffer illnesses like cancer, which they say is a legacy of the nuclear tests. While the testings of the 1950s and 60s have no direct connection to the waste dump, the women say they've been told before by experts they were safe from nuclear harm. They've been telling that lie for, for years. Doesn't matter how many people die and they'd be still telling you nothing as long as they get what they want. As long as they get it and take it over there and bring the rubbish back here to the clean land, instead of leave, leaving it and putting it in their backyard where they're doing it. The federal government says science is on its side. They've researched for years, locating and storing the waste according to strict government guidelines, which they say is world's best practice. People have just lost sight of the degree of risk and the degree of hazard associated with this repository, which is very, very small and uh, well, our media, all of us, we tend to have a, uh, a sense of alarm whenever the word radioactive is mentioned and uh, issues of how serious it might be are simply not thought through. What about the transportation of this waste? There's been some concerns raised about any sort of spillages along the way. Isn't that something for people to be worried about? No, it's not an issue. We transport radioactive materials throughout Australia under the regulations which are international regulations governing the transport of radioactive materials. Well they can say what they like. I mean they told the people of this state that the nuclear weapons testings of the 50s and 60s were totally safe. That's what they told us and after decades of, of fighting to get the clean-up, even that clean-up hasn't cleaned up the plutonium and americium and cesium and uranium and strontium-90 that was left in the desert. Most South Australians don't want a national radioactive waste dump in their backyard. The state has even moved to make it illegal for any radioactive waste to be transported into South Australia. Mr. Speaker, shortly after noon... Like Aboriginal groups, the state government wants waste to be kept where it's made. So there's all these people out in the community and in the media who want me to roll over, turn my toes up, you know, and maybe if they tickle my belly with some, give me some money that I might actually say, take the land. Well, I'm, my vote can't be bought and neither can it be rented. So we're going to fight this every step along the way. We're going to fight them for compensation. We're going to fight their ac compulsory acquisition of the land. We, we will negotiate. We will, if necessary, move to acquisition. But at the end of the day, this is a, a tiny area of land and uh, the repository will be properly licensed and operated under the, the law. What would you want to say to the federal government? Well, I'd say to the federal government, they want to have another look at their democratic process that they're continually bragging about. Because this is something that should not be occurring. It's being fobbed onto the South Australian people against their will. And that is not democracy. It's a far cry. Aboriginal groups say the law of human rights has been ignored during the whole process to establish a national waste dump. 
And while they plan to use the Native Title Act to stop the dump, the government is expected to override that piece of legislation to make sure the dump goes ahead as planned. Thank you. This whole consultation process, we felt, was a rot from the start. I mean, it was, as if, it was almost as if they had a, a piece of paper with boxes in there they needed to tick off. You know, Aboriginal consultation, I would have done that to get box to tick. The past was, oh yeah, tick. Community consultation, oh yeah, we've done that. Our door is still open to try to negotiate a sensible agreement, and it's not tokenistic, it's very genuine. They're just worrying about the dollars. And we're not worrying about the dollar, we're worrying about the life and for the generations to come. We've spoken with the senior lawmen and women to the, to the north and west, and they're just waiting for a word, and once that word's out, um, we, we're going to do something, you know. Um, they'll have to just wait and see, won't they? The federal government will soon announce a second nuclear dump site after ruling out co-location in South Australia. With major changes to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission and a cloud hanging over its leadership, where does that leave Indigenous affairs? Here to discuss these issues is former ATSIC chairperson and champion fighter for Indigenous rights, Dr Loija O'Donoghue. Dr O'Donoghue, thanks very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Uh, firstly, what do you make of the Minister's uh, changes to ATSIC and the stripping of powers from its elected arm? Uh, well, uh, Carla, while I'm not uh, happy with the term of stripping the elected arm of uh, financial arrangements, uh, I did recommend during my time, at the end of it, uh, a separation of powers. Uh, and so the Minister's actually gone down the same track as I recommended. Um, and um, it was really all about um, six years of trying to get the elected representatives uh, to actually move away from the conflict of interest situation and the pork barrelling that was going on. So I can't, uh, I can't run away from that. Uh, that certainly was my recommendation. So do you think Mr Ruddock has taken things to the extreme by taking powers away from the elected arm and placing major responsibilities with this new agency and uh, also with the CEO, Wayne Gibbons? Well, to some extent, I think he's gone further than I would have uh, recommended. Uh, and I think that he has uh, also preempted the outcomes of the uh, review process. Uh, and I was rather more prepared uh, to await the outcome of the review process and uh, I wanted to get involved, of course, with um, uh, looking at uh, their recommendations and I'm still looking forward to their recommendations as well. But to some extent, I know that my own people see uh, the move that the ministers made as uh, taking away self-determination. Do you think that um, his decision was swayed by the controversies being surrounded by uh, Chairman Jeff Clark and Deputy Chair Ray Robinson? Well look I can't read his mind on that but I think uh, both those leaders uh, have uh, let us down uh, and I think it would have been much better and the Minister would have been able to deal with this matter I think if they were prepared to stand aside uh, for the time it took for the Minister to consider these, um, uh, these um, major changes that he's making. You've been quoted as, as saying that you were disappointed with the re-election of Mr Clark and Mr Robinson in their respective positions. Are you still disappointed? Oh, definitely. I'm still disappointed. And I think that the present elected representatives um, need to stand up and be counted. Uh, they have the opportunity now uh, to deal with uh, those matters uh, around the board table and it seems as if they're not prepared to do that. Where do you see things headed um, in the future for Indigenous affairs? Well, look, basically, I, uh, Carla, I want to wait for the, um, um, the outcome of the review process. I don't want to see the clock turn back. I want to see us having self-determination as we'd fought for that for many years. Um, 
but I think that all of us uh, as Aboriginal people really have to um, uh, understand that when we go to the ballot box we are in fact electing leaders and we need to understand that and uh, at the end of the process I think we've got what we ask for. <laughs>